And this is Michael Kovett and, and um, ask everyone to mute. I'll monitor the chats, uh, the chat box. If you have questions, I know we had one question come in already, but this, this is all about asking questions. So it's kind of like an open mic. And, and we have Sam Goldenberger, who was uh, really great on our first round in March. And so this is like the Ask a Mechanic series. And we chose to open it up for your questions uh, this evening. So we're in July the 12th, uh, 2021. And um, I think what I'm going to do here is kind of ask everyone if you have questions, kind of bring it on, you know, please drop it in the chat box. Sam, how about introducing yourself, share your expertise with everyone. And then why don't we start with the first question that came in on uh, measuring uh, chain length. Um, and we'll start with that and then we'll allow the questions to bubble up. How's that? that sounds good. All right, go for it. All right, welcome GPC. Uh, my name is Sam Goldenberg. I run a little shop here uh, at the base of uh, Joaquin Miller, Redwood, et cetera, just off Highway 13 called Goldie's Gears. Can you hear me? I'm seeing thumbs that need to come up. Uh, I'm not muted, so you should be able to hear me. Um, yep, we can hear you. Okay, I'm seeing little thumbs that are going, hey, speak louder. Anyway, I'll try to project a little bit here. Um, so I run a shop called Goldie's Gears. Um, it's a little home repair shop, um, and uh, at, at this shop here, I work on anything from road bikes to mountain bikes, um, electronic bicycles, uh, you name it, we do it here. Hydraulic disc brakes, electronic shifting, etc. cetera. Um, it's been nice to uh, receive some questions, although I didn't get as many as I was hoping, so I figure we can start with the one, and the first question was, how do I measure my chain for wear? Um, that question being, do I measure, do I use my chain wear indicator in multiple places? Do I just drop it in? So let's just take a look at a couple of chains and a couple of chain measuring or chain wear measuring devices. So we can start from there. Um, without further ado, here are a couple that I have here. Do my best uh, to kind of let you see these. Well, let's see, I have a light here as well. So, this tool, you kind of see that. This tool is uh, made by Park. Uh, it's called CC Chain Checker 3.2. It's a solid piece of stamped steel, and it's essentially two sided. It has two measurements, one side being representative of, I don't know that my camera is going to show this. Can you see a couple of little numbers there? They're gonna be, yeah, probably not. Right there, you can see a couple of numbers. They're gonna be faint, but in any event, one of them says 0 0.5 and the other, just barely see it there, says 0 0.75. And we're talking about percentage, 0.5%, 0.75%. So what you do with this tool, and I'll put on some gloves here to demonstrate because every chain is filthy and disgusting, is, your chain here and this happens to be a this is a nine speed chain you take this tool and you'll notice that the two ends look quite a bit different this end has these little ears on them and this one has kind of this straight piece i take the side with the ears and in this case i'm going to drop the 0.5 side in first just anywhere essentially anywhere on the chain so the question was where do i measure from multiple places one place etc start somewhere I drop in this ear, this um, ear side, and then I pivot this flat piece down until it makes contact here with the chain. And you'll notice that I can't drop this unit all the way down flat, flush against the chain. Uh, typically, what that would mean is that this chain is not yet worn to the point where it needs replacement. In the case of this particular tool, I find this tool to be Mm, subpar in the sense that if it is not perfectly straight, it bent in any way, um, it is inaccurate. And I found that this tool had fallen off of my magnetic tool holder on my bench and hit the ground and had actually bent. I don't know if you can see this on the zoom there, but it is ever so slightly bent on the top. 
that makes all the difference. So now this tool is totally inaccurate. It's a piece of laser cut steel. Um, I put it in a vise, tried to straighten it out. It's basically useless. I don't use it anymore. I kept it around for frankly, exactly this sort of an example as to why you shouldn't get this tool. If you can keep from dropping this tool, then good for you. Um, otherwise, this is considered a go, no go tool. It doesn't tell you states, it doesn't tell you specific states of wear. It tells you whether the thing, whether your chain is within spec or out of spec. It doesn't really give you much specific. So as far as the 0 0.5 is concerned, if this, if you can drop this into your chain and this 0 0.5 works for um, specifically 11 and 12 speed chains. So from five speed through 10 speed, if you can drop in the 0 0.75 or just drop it in, your chain is worn. Ideally ever so slightly before this. For the newer chains, 11 and 12 speeds, if you can drop mm -hmm. in the 0 0.5, most manufacturers will say your chain is worn. Um, if you're going well beyond those numbers, not only is your chain worn, but the likelihood of your cassette, maybe even chain rings being worn is also pretty likely. Um, so that's something to take into effect then. So this tool, go, no go. 0.5%, 0.75%. Tool that I prefer, Let's see if we can do it some justice here. I have a more mild flashlight here. Maybe this one works a little bit. I can put it against my shirt. Let's see, this one. You can sort of make this thing out a little bit. It's called the, uh, just barely, the Chain Checker CC-2. And what it has going on here, I'm gonna do my best to make it visible. Let's see, there we go. You can sort of see this scale here. There's a little window there. All right, a little window and some numbers in there from zero to 1.0. What this allows you to do, same idea, it's got a pin here and a pin here, much like we had the ear and this little stick, these two little points. In this case, these pins get dropped into the chain. Same idea, drop it in somewhere. And, and to answer that initial question, no, you don't have to drop in a chain through your chain checker tool any number of places. The only reason you'd have to do that is if maybe you had a piece of gunk or some chunk of dirt or a stick or oil or something in your chain it was impeding an accurate measurement. And then moving it somewhere else would just, if you had inconsistent results, you would know uh, that you had something in your chain, right? But no, so we drop this pin in and we drop the pin in here. And then what I do is I move this little scale along You can see that this thing moves back and forth. And I look inside the little hole, the little window and I get a reading, there's a number in there. You can't really, I doubt you can tell or be able to read this from the image here, but I can tell you that this one says, more than 0.5, less than 0.75. Looks like about 0 0.66, 0 0.68. So this is a nine speed chain. This is within spec, good chain. Um, that said, if I were gonna put this chain back on a bicycle, I would put this chain on a bicycle with the components that it was being used with previously. I, despite this being in, in spec, I wouldn't put this on a bicycle with new nine speed components, a new cassette, new chain rings. I would put a new chain on with that but is certainly okay to use with, uh, to have taken off, cleaned up and put back on with the drivetrain it was being used with. So a couple of chain tools. Um, this one I, I rather like. Again, this is a park tool model, CC-2 chain checker. Um, gives, you, uh, gives you a nice range, a little bit more accuracy. It tells you a little bit more about the life of your chain. And then we have our go, no go, stamp steel, laser cut, something like that. Not bad but uh, prone, to, prone to inaccuracy should you drop it on the floor, <laughs> okay? So I also have some other chains here. Uh, this is this nine speed chain. Uh, I can show you the, well, I don't know if you'll be able to tell. I don't know if it makes a difference, but I have, a, I have another bicycle on the stand here. Uh, and this is a 11 speed bicycle. Um, and the wear on the chain is significantly less than even the 0.68. Um, I can drop it in here and just tell you what it says. And it's less than 0.5. And so it is still within the manufacturer's um, recommended life, essentially. Hey, Sam, that's, that's awesome. Any, any questions from the participants or, you know, the audience here, anything related to chains? Because we have a, a, a question. Um, 
from Mark about tubeless tires, but I, I want to just, while we're on drivetrain, any other chain questions that, that uh, people have? I see Philip has one there. Go ahead, Philip. Um, I could ask a quick, can I just ask a question verbally? Yeah, go ahead. Just talk about uh, your preferred method for cleaning uh, a chain and how often that kind of just standard advice. Sure. Yeah, so I have, um, I have a, a tank here. It's called an ultrasonic uh, parts cleaner. You typically see them in jewelry shops. So they, it runs some electrified current uh, through a, a solvent bath. Um, there's a basket that you, and a heated tank that you put parts in. If you don't have one of those, and they're not incredibly expensive, but they're a couple hundred bucks. And if this is not something you do for a living, it's probably not something you're going to invest in. What I recommend is something along the lines of this. Again, another park tool product. This is called the Cyclone Chain Scrubber. This model is the CM 5.3. I don't know if this is the latest iteration, but essentially it's got a little handle on it. Uh, mine's actually got some liquid in it now, but there are there's foam and a series of little uh, rotating brushes in here. And what you'll do is you'll fill up to this dotted line here that you can see with uh, in this case, I think I put Simple Green in here. Um, Park Tool makes uh, a cleaning solution. You'll fill that thing up. There's a top to it. You'll uh, you'll run your chain through this, put the top on, click these little um, clips in place, and then just back pedal. And this thing does an amazing job scrubbing chains. If uh, somebody is not paying me for a drivetrain clean, in other words, remove their drivetrain, put it in my parts washer and reinstall it, then this is typically the tool that I will use. And I find it is excellent. Um, as far as how often to clean your chain, I would say it's going to depend, of course, on how dirty your chain is and or how often you're going for a bike ride. Um, you know, for me, I think uh, if, I'm, if it's a mountain bike ride and I, the chain gets uh, muddy, then I'm going to hose the bike down and clean the chain and lubricate after each ride. If it's a little bit dusty, hopefully the lubricant that I chose is actually going to repel some of that dust hold up pretty well on its own. And then maybe that'll be every four rides or something like that. As far as a road bike goes, um, again, gonna, gonna depend on conditions, but maybe every four, five, six, eight rides, it's gonna depend. Uh, ideally you change it before you hear things squeaking. Okay, uh, that's certainly a good indication that your chain needs some lubricant. Um, you can't hurt your chain by lubing it more often. Um, what you can do that can be detrimental with excess lube is not wiping off the lubricant after you've applied it. So what you want to do is clean the chain, dry it, apply chain lubricant, and then with a dry, clean towel, you want to remove that excess lube uh, that's on the exterior of the chain so that it's not going to attract dust and make for mud and muck and a whole bunch of crap. So you can lube as often as you want so long as you clean off the exterior of the chain. All we really want or for the interior lubricating parts, the, the bushings and the plates uh, and the pins that are touching one another um, to stay lubricated. The exterior we want dry, ideally. Okay. Terrific. Uh, other, other questions or follow-up, Jeff? I think Philip had a question there. Not really. I was just curious that there was a difference in the change spacing between the it changed prior with nine up to nine speed and then with the 10 and 11 is a different spacing so there isn't a difference in the distance between the pins there isn't a difference between these points here they're still designed for a, a 330 seconds uh chain so to speak or or chain wheels of the teeth the difference is in the width of the chain so these narrower chains are a bit more flexible and they tend to have quite a bit more friction between the plates and those rollers and thus uh, they wear out quite a bit quicker. They're just not as robust. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of claims that manufacturers will make for one thing or another, but the idea being that oftentimes, especially with these one by systems where the chains are being put on such extreme angles, they're just going to wear out that much quicker. You know, if you want your chain to, to live a long time, not only keep it clean and lubricated, but keep it keep it in in line you know people talk about chain line if you've ever heard that especially for a single speed bike 
like a track bike or something like that yeah. and uh, cross chaining that's one way you're going to extend the life of your chain if you have a triple for instance if you're in the middle chain ring be in the middle segment of gears you know somewhere like four five six seven or something like that if you're in your granny gear you want to be in you know seven eight nine ten or something like that as opposed to some of the higher gears so that you have basically a straight line and you're wearing the the chain out uniformly good okay we have a, another chain question that came in uh this is from uh it says christine or, or, or mark uh, any thoughts on waxing chains hot bath versus just lube people do it uh, it's a little labor intensive um you can you can boil up a pot of paraffin wax and dump your chain it's, a, it's apparently one of the better ways to keep your chain um i just can't be uh, <laughs> i can't be bothered to do it it's a bit of work um but feel free you know and there are products out there um one in particular is very popular and several of my clients michael included use it called squirt lube um, which is a wax based product um, but again it's a little bit labor intensive um and if you forget to use only squirt lube you then have uh, a pretty involved process in uh, removing excess lubricant, dirt, contaminants, et cetera, from your drivetrain in order to then reapply Squirt Loops product. Uh, yeah, go go ahead and buy some bricks of paraffin and melt them down and dunk your chain in there. Um, let it dry out. Apparently, that's, apparently it's excellent. Um, I've never done it myself. I don't know. I just buy a wax-based lube and leave it at that. Good. I'm going to, in, in the interest of uh, time here, um, I want to uh, switch to a different topic. Um, so, Ipon, uh, it looks like you just joined. Can I ask you to put yourself on mute, please? Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Mark. Do you have experience with tubeless tires? Yeah, what, what do you want to know about them? I got plenty of experience. Well, I'm just, you know, I've, I've been working with them and getting them, um, every time I put one on and try to get it set up, it's it's always a bit of a challenge. And I'm doing this now on road tubeless and um, gravel, gravel tubeless. Those are yeah. a lot more challenging for me than a mountain bike tubeless tire, for sure. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just, it just seems like it's a bit of a, a trial and error process that I've been going through for a long time to get them held up. Sometimes they uh, leak from the sides, yeah. you know, from the bead. Um, so, okay. I, good question, Mark. And I'm, I was prepared for this question and the bike in my stand needs new tires and I got some tires hanging from the handlebar. So I was thinking, okay, I'm great. Try to do that. Now that said, they're not tubeless tires. I'm gonna put inner tubes in here. But the concept of installing them is the same. And as far as the leaking from the bead is concerned, a um, couple of ways you can mitigate that. Um, first thing is using a tubeless tape or a rim tape. Most of it looks like this, or just strapping tape. This is uh, from Stan's No Tubes. It's this kind of uh, classic yellow. But I mean, there are a lot of manufacturers that make this stuff. Here's one in black. Uh, what you want to do, what, the way I measure the right width tape, to actually take a look at the exterior of the rim as I'm standing over it with my, st uh, with my stand, looking straight at it. And I take the, the tape out and I put it over the rim and I wanna see the, the width of the tape match the external width of the rim. I'm not looking at the internal width because when I lay this tape down, there are all kinds of ridges along the profile of the bottom of the rim. It's not straight across. So I need a little bit of extra width. Yep. Not only that, I need the, uh, someone's microphone sounds like it's on. Anyway, um, I just hear an echo. Um, what you also want out of this uh, rim tape is for some of the edge of the tape to go up into the side of the bead well so that there's no chance of any sealant, um, let alone getting the tightest fit uh, on, your, uh, on your rim. No chance of any sealant escaping underneath the tape and getting out of your uh, spoke holes. Um, and also having a really tight fit with the bead up against the, uh, the hook of the rim. Um, so picking the right rim tape, the right width tape, if you're finding you do have plenty wide tape that's uh, not coming out of the top of your rim, certainly covering 
the sides are good thing, and you're still having a leak problem, what you can do is add an additional layer. So oftentimes I will start with one layer, other mechanics use more than one. I find, um, I find typically the thing to do is one for tubeless and actually two for a tube. Um, but people have different thoughts about that. You can add layers of this to increase thickness along the rim bed in order to make a tighter fit. You know, if you have a smaller diameter that that bead is sitting on, it's essentially going to be tighter um, on the rim and thus more airtight and you won't have sealant leaking out. Um, as far as getting those pesky tubeless tires on your rim, yes, it is harder than it used to be. You're not crazy. The reason it's harder is the bead of these tires the bead of these tires is larger um, it is has a more pronounced square edged profile and that is in part to lock in place to the mating feature the mating square edged hook on the rim uh, even better um, additionally that rim bed that we're talking about, the area where you place the rim tape, that diameter is a little bit larger. So the tire doesn't sit quite as deep in there and it is harder to get that last little bit of your tire on. So you're not crazy, it is harder to mount these things. Uh, the thing about tubeless though that's nice is, I'm sure you've been chastised, I'm sure everybody's been chastised for using uh, tire levers, these tools that are designed to take the tire off when you have a flat tire, using these to put your tire on the bike. Well, with an inner tube, yeah, that's a no-no. The likelihood of you actually pinching the inner tube and in trying to lever your tire on and putting a hole in the inner tube is highly likely. So you're gonna give yourself a flat before you even get down the road. With tubeless, however, you don't have an inner tube in there. So use this all day. Just, you might break a few of them, but go ahead, not a problem. Um, that said, there's another tool that I might have mentioned in the last seminar here, but I will reiterate, I'm a big fan. It's called the Tire Jack. You can see this tool here. It is made by Cool Stop. Essentially, uh, this rigid piece with the little hook there sits on the rim, and this bit, which is flexible, hooks onto the bead of the tire. And what you can do is essentially lever your tire onto your rim and I will use it and here's a tire and if you will I'll point the camera over to what I'm doing here and I'll put this tire and I'll give you some other tips that are going to make installing a tire easier. Um, as far as tubeless goes one thing that's going to really help you even just get the tubeless tire on period um, is having a compressor. Not every tire nor rim combination requires a compressor um, they're getting pretty good at those, even with the smaller um, road width tubeless tires. But boy, it sure helps to have a large volume of air in a very short period of time to snap those things in place. That said, um, let me point this over here. I'll get this one going. You can watch my technique uh, in uh, getting the tire off and then getting this other one on. But feel free to ask some questions while I'm doing this. You know, I've been using one of those little tanks, you know, you, you pump it up to 150 pounds and then it releases a, a, uh, some air, you know, and helps get it, get it, you know, popping to, towards the edge, which is, you know, that clicking you need, but it, it sure would be, I'd rather have a compressor. I can tell you that just because yeah. sometimes I have to do that like half a dozen times and I'm just kind of worn out by the time yeah. I'm, you know, done with that. And I don't know whether, yeah, the, I don't know if there's, how much is a compressor to buy? Is that an expensive thing to get? And it sort of depends. Um, you know, you can get a little one for 50, 60 bucks, but uh, you know, you have to turn it on and have it running almost all the time for it to be of any use. So I bought a rather large one. It's like a, I think it's like 20 gallons. It's pretty big, um, but it was 200 bucks. So um, if it's something that's just going to sit in your garage, maybe not worth it, but uh, that said, even if you have all the right tools, let's say you have the big compressor and you got the sealant and all the tools to pull the valve core out and all that stuff, um, some tire and tube, some tire and rim combinations are just fuzzy or uh, fussy rather, um, and some just don't work that well. 
We gotta get creative. So, these tires just happen to be old. They actually have quite a bit of tread, but they are the original tires to this bike. This is about a three year old bike. Um, there are quite a lot of cracks in here. I recommended that the client get new tires. Um, and he said, yep, yeah, sounds good. So here we are putting new ones on there. So what I do is I take the air out and then you'll notice I push, I'm gonna push the bead. Let's see if you can see this here. Get that backlight out of the way. See if I can show you this. Uh, the lighting's a little funny, so here we go. You're gonna see the separation from the, the rim and the tire. I can fit my finger in there. Um, having just deflated it, there's still some areas where I need to pull it away. I'm gonna come all the way around and just, uh, let's see, can you see my hands? I'm gonna pull the tire away from the edge of the rim, all the way around, okay? And in doing so, what I'm doing is dropping the tire beads and the beads are this bit of aramid fiber or sometimes steel fiber. It's a, essentially a wire running all the way around the inner diameter of the tire. What I'm doing is dropping it into the concave segment in the middle that your tubeless rims will have. And that is a very important feature of the tubeless rim. So what we do, I push this away break the seal from the side. I do it on both sides. Okay. Then what I'm going to do, and what, what that does is essentially drop the inner diameter, the bead of the tire down into the smallest diameter, which gives me the most leverage, right? So I could really, even without a tool right now, because I've dropped it down into that channel, I can pull this up over and down, probably with my hands, but figure we'll use this tool because it's handy. And this is your Friendly tire lever, everybody's got one of these, right? I'm sure. So chances are I'll just need one right now. So what I do is I peel the bead away. Now you can see the rim, the bottom of the, the rim there and the, and the tire bead. And I just wanna hook, I wanna use this edge here to hook that one bead, pry it over, resting on the edge of the rim and then push away from my body Let's get, make sure I'm good and snug in there. Push away from my body while maintaining close contact to the rim. And then work all the way around. And I've unseated the tire on the one side. Um, you don't have to push away from you, but the chance of you slipping out and thumping yourself in the chest is pretty high. Ask me how I know. Um, so pushing away from you is probably the way to do it. So after having unseated one side of the tire, you'll notice I got half, I got this segment of tire still on there and this one is hanging off the edge. What I then do is I take the inner tube, pull that out of there, still got half the tire on, and then up, over, and down, and I'm working opposite the valve. The valve has uh, got some stuff in the way, so I like to work on the opposite side of the valve. I go up, over, down, and the tire's off, okay? So, Excuse me, Sam, Sam can we um, move a little quickly through this because I think there's some other questions and I just proportionally, time-wise, <clears throat> want to make sure we can address. Okay. So the questions. only thing that's gonna help you as far as this, uh, as far as getting those pesky tubeless tires on is making sure that you're down in that center channel. Um, so now the same is true with a, a tube tire. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, just like I did in reverse, I'm going to set that one, one bead down in that center channel. And then I'm not even going to put the tube on. I'll just show you how easy it is. Um, in having that other, in having one bead on there, down into the center, I have essentially just slack. That's what I'm giving myself, right? So if you have it all wedged up on the higher portion of the rim, closer to the, to the edge, to the hook, you're never gonna get it on there. Now, I'm getting close, I'm right at the edge here. I can feel this just with experience, I can do this with my hands. If I didn't have that experience, um, and I ignore the strength in my hands, in this case, if this were tubeless, I could use my tire lever. I could just wedge it under there and lever it in place, just like you've done before and been chastised about, right? No problem, and we're installed, okay? So that's that. As far as the leak is concerned, put some extra tape in there. 
um, and give it a spin. Make sure it has enough air that the bead is completely locked into place all the way around. When you're looking at the profile of the tire, there's typically a little line. You see that little line near my finger? There's often a little line indicating um, uniformity uh, along the edge of the rim there. So you just wanna make sure that line looks about even all the way around. That would tell you that the bead is all the way locked in place and that um, everything's as good as it can be if you're still leaking at that point. More seal it, more tape. Great. Hey, thank you. Um, I know we moved through that a little quickly. If we have time, we can uh, come back to it. One, there was one other question related to tires, um, maybe two. Uh, one was, uh, what, what's the best way to determine whether it's time to replace a tire? That was from Paul. Okay. Yeah, so in the instance of the tire that I just took off, uh, most tires have tire wear indicators as far as road tires are concerned. I'm looking for one now. Oh, yep, here they are. Don't know how easy you're going to see this on here. Often what we're talking about is a little divot uh, cut into the tire, like a little hole, essentially. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but you see that? Yeah, you can see that right there. See that little hole? Now that's not a hole from, uh, from something on the road. That's not a cut. That's actually designed by Specialized, put in their tire. The idea being that when you can no longer see this hole, you have reached the, uh, you burn through the tread. You're at the bottom. Okay, so that's one way to tell. The other way is, gosh, my tire sure is cracking a lot. How old is this thing? Maybe it's, maybe it's several years old. Maybe it's been stored outside. Um, the sun will degrade your rubber products. They will no longer be sticky. They will lose their... Uh, nice rubber properties, and they will need replacement. Um, if you have old tan wall tires, they will dry rot, they will crumble. Um, if you have a lot of cuts, if you find yourself getting incessant flats, one after the other, time for a new tire. Okay, that's really, really helpful. No, that's, that's good. Uh, thank you for that. And one question related to tire with from Phil, do you align the tire label with the valve stem? Yep, so the reason to do that is not just to be a cool pro, um, the reason to do that, let's say your valve stem is right here. So here's my, you can see the, you can see the label. Yep. My valve stem right here. And let's say uh, I get a flat and I pull this thing out of there. I pull the tube out and I go, well, here's the hole in my tube. And I go, well, hmm, where, I can't figure out where relative, this hole relative to the tire, uh, the hole is. Well, you, if, if you line it up with this label, especially if it's like a narrow label, you know it's either, let's say it's uh, 10 inches from your valve. Well, it's either 10 inches on this side or 10 inches on this side if you didn't pay attention. Uh, and then you'll easily be able to find a piece of glass or the wire or whatever it is that caused your flat. So that's the reason to do that. That's great. Thank you. Yep. Um, so let me switch to another question here. This is from Richard. I recently got a bike with disc brakes and noticed I have to pull the brake lever pretty far, levers plural, pretty far before the brake engages, almost to the bar, I assume the handlebar. Is this just a preference thing or does this indicate that uh, something needs to be a, a addressed? Uh, this is a hydraulic disc brake bike. Yes. It sounds that way, yeah. Yeah, so likely what you need, if this is a new bike and the brake pads and or the rotors are new, sounds like what you need is the uh, brake master cylinders or the reservoirs at the levers topped up. Sounds like they are not backfilling enough fluid behind the pistons um, and or a bleed, a brake bleed. They should be, most systems are quite firm, frankly. Um, and engage rather quickly. If you have the levers adjusted so that if like, let's say you have slightly smaller hands and you like the levers closer to the bar, then you might sacrifice some of the firm feeling, um, the quicker engagement. But if that's not the case, um, sounds like you need a bleed or to have uh, your levers topped up. Um, worst case scenario, there's a leak somewhere, especially if it started firm and is now soft like this after a short period of time. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Good. Um, let's see, another question. I'm gonna read this one. Um, and Richard, can I ask you to put yourself on mute a second? I, I'm, I'm not able to pin, um, I, I'd like to be able to pin um, 
Sam. But in the meanwhile, I have a question from Steve. Um, so it breaks on a specialized road bike. The entire caliber assembly won't recenter after each application. So, uh, so often after each application, so often slight rubbing on one side, any fix or replacement part parts. Shop in Berkeley said characteristics of brand. This is for a, another hydraulic disc brake. I assume so, but I'm not sure. Uh, is is uh, Steve Tracy on the line here? If this is for a hydraulic disc brake, this is actually. Hi. Oh, go ahead. I'm masquerading as Abby. Okay. Go, go ahead there, Steve. I have a, a specialized tarmac with the old school brakes. Okay. And they were clinging to one side or the other as a unit, the whole unit. And I took them to a shop and 45 minutes of work later, it's pretty much, that's too bad, so sad. It's part of the brand and they took them apart and rebuilt them so I can say they're a little better, but they're not perfect. Hmm. So what you're describing where if you have a road caliper brake, a traditional road caliper brake, um, where you have the brakes centered to the rim and then you squeeze the brakes and then the whole unit kicks over to one side is something that's sort of typical of like a single pivot brake, like old style Campagnolo, Modolo, Universal brakes. Um, for dual pivot brakes, where there are two pivot points where the arms move, way less common. Um, and I, I've spent plenty of time trying to mitigate that problem. Um, it can come down to, yes, like taking them apart and lubricating the mating surfaces. Um, you know, one of the biggest issues can be um, the housing length um, and or the stiffness of the rear housing. It can um, control the angle of the two mating pieces. So those, those brake calipers are several pieces mushed together. Um, and if one of those pieces is a little bit off, there's more friction on one than the other, and it can impede the movement left, right, front, and back. Um, so it can not only make them, when you pull the brake lever, it can keep it kind of clamped together, but it can also kick it over to one side if that, if that housing is too stiff and pushing in one way. Um, if it's the Axis brand caliper, which is kind of specialized in-house thing, I think they're made by Tektro. Um, you know, they weren't wrong in telling you it's kind of a mediocre product. That said, um, it might just need a hell of a lot of fine tuning um, and getting that piece of housing just right and that the length of the cable and adjusting the tension between the mating bodies. The problem with um, a, a product like that, that not only could work out just fine, but requires a hell of a lot of work to make it work out is that you're just gonna end up paying somebody to work on it that much more and you should have just bought the better one. I don't have a great answer for you. That's typical of like a single pivot break where um, the movement of one arm is contingent on the other and it does tend to shift things over. But I'm guessing that rear brake is still dual pivot. And I'm imagining that it is the rear brake that's moving and not the front is my guess. Um, but um, I don't know, send it over here. I'll take a look at it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yep. All right, uh, let's see. I think it we I think we got the questions here. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Why don't we open it up? I, I have a, a quick one just while others, if people have uh, more, we can you know drop please drop them in there. Um, how do you know when your chain rings are worn? What's is there some sort of measurement around that? So Oftentimes, you, it's best to keep, so there, there are visual cues, just like there are on cassette teeth. You'll probably have heard the term shark tooth or sharky looking teeth and where mm. you have a wave to them. Oftentimes, a chain ring looks more or less like this, a chain ring tooth anyway. 
looks more or less like that when it's new. And after a good bit of wear, will look more like this. It will be sort of hooked, hooked on the front of one end. And that's not even all that exaggerated. I've seen very, very sharp looking. Uh, if you're cutting your hand. Oh, I, oh my gosh. Okay. Your teeth and you're, you're uh, too far gone. Um, so a, yes, they're visual cues. Okay, if they look, if they look like curled over, almost like a rip curl, like a wave. Um, yeah, they're, they're a bit far gone. Um, and second, we, there's a kind of a typical range for mileage. Um, so, so the three wear components in the drivetrain being the chain, the cassette, and the chain rings. Admittedly, we could talk about rear derailleur pulleys as being part of that, but less so. Um, chain's gonna wear the quickest, then the cassette, then the chain ring. It's simply based on size and materials, but mostly the size. Um, so the larger the ring, the more chain wrap, the more distribution of that pressure. So the large chain ring is typically the last one to go. Chains, it depends on the rider, but I like to replace every thousand to 1500 miles, sometimes less depending. Cassettes, I typically like to go through two chains, two and a half, maybe three, but two, two chains per cassette, depending on how often you change them. If you change them more often, you could go three, maybe 3,000 plus miles on a cassette. Okay, and then chain rings, you know, again, the last one to go there, but small chain ring before the big one, et cetera, three, three, four, something like that. It's really gonna depend on the quality of the product that you bought, how dirty everything is, how, how good you are at cleaning and replacing those chains. The more frequently you change the chains out, uh, the longer the rest of the system will last. Ah, okay. Yeah. Very good. Let me open it up. Uh, other other questions out there? We still have some time with Sam. Do you want to get back into the tires or? Could I, I could ask you a question about disc brakes and squeaking and eliminating the squeak for cleaning or, or uh, changing the, the brake pads? Sure. Yeah, the ever noisy modern disc brake system. Um, <laughs> it's funny because disc brakes have been around for tens and tens of years, uh, you know, set, I don't know, 70 years or something like that, 60 years. Um, on automobiles, they're, the systems are just so much bigger, even on motorcycles. So, you know, as soon as you go, get on the highway and use your brakes, anything that might've been contaminated on the surface of that brake rotor is gone like that, right? You're talking about a 400 pound vehicle, and tens of, you know, hundreds, thousands more pounds of pressure, right? Disc brakes, on the other hand, on bicycles are very thinny, very thin. I can bend this thing with my hands, okay? Um, minimum wear, minimum uh, uh, width or minimum thickness on most rotors before they recommend you replace them is one and a half millimeters. Okay. When they're brand new, they're like 1.68. So not much. We're, we're talking about a very small piece of stamped steel. Um, and they are very prone to contamination. If you've ever heard, if you ever walked in your shop and gotten the answer, why does, or asked the question, why does my brake squeal? The answer is often contaminated. It's contaminated. Okay. Contamination means anything from riding along, splashing in a puddle and getting some oily water on your brake rotor or pad and then going through a brake cycle system. In other words, heating that system up, opening up the pores in the metal of the brake rotor, as well as on the pads, and that dirt or that oil working its way down all the way through the pad or embedding itself in the rotor material. And then no matter what you do to clean the surface off, you're going to come in contact with it uh, as, you, as you break along. So cleanliness is next to brakeliness or something like that. Um, don't touch the rotors. I know they're shiny and pretty, but uh, you have oil on your hands. My grandfather was a watchmaker for 36 years. And before he got his apprenticeship, he walked into a, a clockmaker or a watchmaker's shop. And the shop owner said, do you rust? And he said, I don't know what you mean. He handed him a pocket watch. He said, what do you think of that? He said, okay, said, that's nice. He handled it. He looked it over, gave it back to him. He said, come back tomorrow. Comes back the following day. The shop owner takes the watch out, looks at the watch, looks at my grandfather and says, you don't rust, you start today. Some people have um, a particularly corrosive sweat 
there's some chemical in your sweat and your perspiration, whatever it may be. It may also be that same person who drips sweat all over their head tube and needs to replace their headset bearings all the time, whatever. Um, this material sweat, even if you don't have a corrosive sweat, um, will contaminate the surface of your brakes. If you notice that you touch your brake rotors, and you go, oh no, that guy on the internet said I shouldn't do that. There are products to clean. You can use 91% isopropyl alcohol, works okay. Um, there's a product from Finish Line, a bicycle brake cleaner. Here, wait a minute. Uh, kind of, I don't want to light it up too much. Bicycle brake cleaner, something like that. You can kind of see it. The Finish Line product, it's, got a, it's blue, it's got a big disc brake on it. This stuff's kind of neat in that it not only cleans, it's a surfactant, but it also dries really, really quickly. So what I do is I go up to the bike, I give the wheel a spin, and I blast this stuff right at the brake caliper. So I get it all over the pads and all over the rotor on both sides, and then I let it dry off. And then in doing so, what you've done with this product is chemically resurface the brake pads. The rotors is, you know, you're not gonna remove all that much metal, but you can remove some kind of a chemical film if you've touched something like that or gotten some splash from the road or something like that. But essentially, instead of sanding the surface of your pads, what this is doing is chemically removing material from those pads. And you're gonna to need to do that bed in process. Again, your brakes are gonna feel weak, um, kind of like they're brand new after you use this product, but you're gonna save yourself headache and or some money in buying new rotors and pads. Oftentimes, if one is contaminated, if you go use the brake, you're gonna contaminate the other component. So the rotor's contaminated and you use the brakes, all of a sudden the pads. Are, so if you have a contaminated rotor and you go, oh, I'll change these pads, it's squeaking. You put new pads in there, you probably just contaminated the new pads. So it's often a case of either, <laughs> either uh, fix them both or uh, just continue throwing money at the problem, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, there are products to clean stuff up. Um, additionally, a smart thing to do, especially in talking about cleaning your chain, cleaning, keeping your bike clean in general, there, there are specific products for this, but you know, you can take like a nitrile glove, you can take a, an old t-shirt or a cloth, a clean one, drape it over your brake rotor, cover it when it's in your stand or on the floor or wherever it is that you keep it and then clean and lubricate your chain so that you're not spraying that stuff all over your brake rotor, let alone just spraying simple green or alcohol on your bike to clean it. And that's one way to, to help mitigate that stuff. But uh, yeah, don't let your friend's kids or yourself or your own kids or, or whoever come up and touch your pretty rotor because they're going to contaminate it. All right, that, that's very good feedback. <laughs> a lot of people... Uh, one, I, I use it a lot. Finish line. Bicycle brake cleaner. Pretty oh, good. good. Yeah. Not perfect. Good, good. Do we have other questions coming in here? Anything else? We have about uh, five to 10 minutes left and uh, wanted to check in and see if we have other, other questions. Hey, just on the, um, I'll ask on, if you were talking about the disc brake rotors, uh, still in terms of centering the, 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 um, the brake relative to the rotor, does he, do, do you use a little shim tool for that or do you just do it? How do you do it? Um, I, I use my eyes and my ears typically. Okay. Um, yeah, there's often not enough space with a road system to put any kind of a shim in there. They're yeah. just very, very close tolerances. Right. Um, especially nowadays when people are scrambling because supply chains have been cut off for uh, the last year and a half. They're scrambling and using any rotor they can with their disc brake systems. And often mountain bike rotors are ever so slightly thicker to, to begin with. And so you have even less clearance mm. uh, in there. And so it's even harder to center your calipers. Um, no, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take a white piece of paper and I'll put it underneath the caliper and eyeball over the top and just try to see a little bit of sliver of white on either side. Um, so I loosen the calipers, or the caliper mounting bolts ever so slightly, squeeze the brake several times, squeeze and hold. Then I'll just lightly tighten and lightly tighten, release, give it a spin, see where it's at. Oftentimes it'll be rubbing maybe in one place 
Um, if that's the case, and I can tell that it would otherwise be centered, what I'll do is take a, my uh, brake rotor truing tool. You can see this is just a metal tool with a little slot in it. Yeah, yeah. What I do is I place it over and I just I spin it. I listen for where it rubs, and then I'll I'll just bend it ever so slightly to try to straighten it out. Even a brand new rotor is often bent straight out of the box, right? They're not that straight. Again, they're just such thin stamped pieces of metal. They just can't be perfect, right? So. Uh, no, so if, uh, if it's not that close, then all I do is back off a little bit on one of the screws, eyeball it, push it over ever so slightly, tighten it, uh, crack the other one, eyeball it, push it over ever so slightly, tighten it, give it a spin, listen for it, et cetera. That's, that's kind of the name of the game. Hmm. That, that's good advice. Hey, we have a question from uh, Christine and Mark. Is the brake line, finish line disc brake cleaner any different than the car? brake cleaner, which is acetone based and also dries quickly because it's acetone. This product specifically says acetone free. I, I don't know if you can see that, but this is not an acetone product. That said, I've used acetone to clean brake rotors. Uh, it works okay. One, one thing that's nice about this product is the pressure that comes out of this nozzle. It is really, really high. So not only does it resurface chemically your uh, brake pads and or your rotor but if there's like physically some gunk on there it will shoot it clean off uh, must use outside in a ventilated area by the way this will make you pretty goofy how often do you, do you proactively use that you know after like a hot and dusty ride on you know on your mountain bike or you've been out riding in the rain on your road bike you know do you like um, do you, you proactively say, wow, before I put the bike away, let me take out the pads, give this, you know, give it a squirt and then put them back in and, you know, go clean up. You know, I'll, I'll, typically what I'll do is I'll use it if I hear it, um, you know, going through the rain is on a mountain bike ride, a muddy ride. Yeah. You'll tend to get some squeal in the middle of your ride, but the mountain bike systems tend to be a bit more robust. They have broader pads. They, the, uh, the rotors tend to be a little bit wider um, and I find you'll get a little bit of squeal, a loss of power, and then you keep using them throughout your ride and they go back to normal. Um, the road bike system's not always the case, but again, it's, it's really just based on loss of power and sound. Sound being the main indicator for most people. Yeah. Got it. Okay. No, that's, that's really, that's really helpful. You know, if you have the telltale, like, uh, like wet finger running around or crystal wine glass, kind of high pitched vibrating yeah. chirp. Yeah, it, it's too late for you, but uh, that's, that's <laughs> you use this yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay. Ideally before that. But yeah, if it's just a little yeah. turkey gobble going on because you're riding through some mud because you're a nut, then you know, good for you. Keep riding. You bet. Yeah. Right. One last question here. Do you recommend resin or metal based metal pads for disc brakes? Um, good question. Um, I typically recommend resin pads for most of my clients because I find they have a very nice linear feel. Um, they're also quieter. So, you know, some people are nervous about disc brakes being so powerful that they're going to go flying over their handlebars. Probably not the case. I think uh, caliper brakes, frankly, from a physics standpoint, you're talking about a rotor that's the size of your wheel with a caliper brake, right? Um, yeah. So as far as stopping power is concerned, I think they're both excellent. Um, the, the resin pad is going to be quieter. It will wear out a little bit quicker than the metallic pad. And the metallic pad often makes a little bit more noise, but not the turkey gobble finger on a crystal wine glass sound. They're just, they just have a different sound, um, but their power is a little bit different. So the resin pad has a very linear power curve, whereas mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the metal pad has a very progressive curve. The harder you squeeze it, the more power you get. I mean, it's, it's like a lot more. It can be. Um, some people prefer that. They, they also tend to last a little longer than resin. So, you know, if you're doing lots of, say, mountain bike downhill runs or something, you're putting a lot of heat through the system, probably better to have the metal. Otherwise, you're just going to be going through pads and rotors pretty quick. Yeah, quicker. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Well, I think we're running right up against the hour. Um, I don't see any other questions in here. So... I think uh, why don't we wrap up for uh, this evening and this event um, for folks um, in your chat box. I put, we have uh, four survey questions. 
So please take, you know, it takes two, three minutes. We'd love the feedback to, you know, tune up. Think about uh, tune up, so to speak. Uh, you know, what ideas can we have for our next, uh, uh, either speakers in general or the next time we have Sam back, you know, where, where there's some topics. So we've we covered, uh, the initial was drivetrains. Today we covered a lot on brakes and tires, which is good. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining. And Sam, thank you so much for, and, and where can people find you? What's the uh, contact info? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have a website, goldiesgears.com. That's G-O-L-D-I-E-S, gears.com. Um, you can also reach me at goldiesgears at Gmail if you want to send me a message there. But you can reach me direct through the website, send me a message, book an appointment. I have my phone number on there as well. I'm sure we can put that up in the chat uh, if you want to take a look there. Yeah. Terrific. All right, everyone. Well, thanks again. This was a really good session. Sam, I appreciate you taking the time and we had uh, 20 people or so today. So this was really great. Nice. Love it. All right. Thanks all. Have a great evening. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.